Okay, today we're going to be in Mark's Gospel. We're going to uh, uh, have a couple of Sundays here where I speak from some of the parables. And so we're going to be in Mark chapter 4. The title of the message is The Seed and the Soil. And uh, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but sometimes somebody will ask me or I'll think about, you know, why is it that it seems like our gospel message falls on deaf ears? And that's really the focus of what Jesus is speaking about in, in, in this parable in Mark chapter 4. Uh, but Jesus does speak in parables, and this is uh, kind of the introduction to what a parable is as, as Jesus began to use it as a means of teaching. And uh, he uses different types of soil to illustrate and compare the different hearts from one person to another. Jesus used parables to create uh, within his disciples a desire to dig deeper, to ask questions as they, as they dug deeper and they, they became curious. And uh, as they began to understand things that had been a mystery to the Old Testament saints. Uh, and these were things that were only fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So Jesus spoke to them and, and uh, uh, it's kind of like you know, when you're listening to to somebody tell a story and they're, they're holding your attention and they're trying to get to the climax and that's what Jesus does with his parables. They're earthly stories with heavenly meanings. Let me read verses 1 through 12. Again Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables and in his teaching he said listen. A farmer went out to sow a seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil, it came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, when he'd got away from the big crowd, and he was there with just the 12 and some of the other disciples, they asked him about the parables, and he told him, the secret of the kingdom has been given to you. So he had spoken to the 12 uh, to the disciples and now when he says to you he's saying that the secret of the kingdom has been given to that small group of people but to those on the outside the other people that had gathered uh, he, he said I spoke everything in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding otherwise they might turn and be forgiven now that's kind of a curious statement there and, and let me give you a quote from an old preacher by the name of G. Campbell Morgan. Morgan said, Jesus used the parabolic method not in order to blind them, but in order to make them look again. Not in order to prevent them from coming to forgiveness, but in order to lure them toward a new attention. And, and, and it's kind of a way where you, there would be resistance if it was very blunt but it creates enough curiosity that you kind of get back past the resistant by somebody coming, in, coming around and coming in the back door and, and, and giving them the gospel witness without them even realizing they're getting it. Well, in the first 12 verses, the verses I just read, Jesus tells the parable, then he emphasizes it's important in the 13th verse. He said, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? So this seems to be the key to understanding the other parables. It seems to be that this is the foundation on which the other parables are spoken and taught. And so that's why we began with this parable today. So now let me read verses 14 through 20. Jesus gives the meaning of the parable, and he begins by stating that, uh, that the seed that is, stone is, uh, that is sown is the word of God. And at this moment... Jesus is the one who is sowing the seed, but he's also saying that the seed is to be sown not just by him, but by pastors, by missionaries, by Christians everywhere, uh, because each of us have our own circle of influence. 
And so Jesus is saying, I'm sowing it, but you need to be sowing it well. It indicates, this parable indicates, that the condition of a person's heart determines the way he or she will receive the word based on the condition of the soil, the condition of the heart. And we can learn several things from this parable. First thing that we learn in verses 14 and 15 is that some hearts have soil that is hard. Jesus said the farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Now, I've got a place in my yard that's right out by the road. And I can go out there every year and I can put some fresh uh, fescue seed down and I can water it a little bit and add a little bit of fertilizer, but it's not going to grow. I've learned this over the years because that's where the mailman drives his vehicle right there. We don't have a curb. And he drives it right up, right over it. People walk their dogs right over it. And it doesn't make any difference how hard I try, but it gets trampled underfoot because it really can't take, take root. And, and this, this is what Jesus is speaking about. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. And it's kind of like when you read this, and, and it's stated in some of the other, uh, uh, other gospel accounts, sometimes the birds will swoop down and they'll eat the seed. And I see that with those pesky blackbirds that fly around, you know, and they eat everything that, that, that you don't want them to eat and won't eat what you wish they would. But if you look at this heart, it's really a heart of what I would call detestation. It detests the holier-and-thou hypocrisy of some and the legalistic demands of others. And because they are looking at other people instead of Jesus, they don't give the seed a chance to take root because the soil of their heart has been hardened due to their perceived injustices. People with hard hearts need to realize their problem is with imperfect people and not the perfect son of God. There are others who will not receive the seed because they love the darkness and they detest the light. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 3, and that's what he said when he wrote his letters. But in John 3 verses 18 through 20 it says, Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Now that word does is proso and it's in, the, it's in the present tense in the Greek and it means to be continually doing something, a regular and habitual habit or routine. So what Jesus is saying, everyone who is continually doing evil hates the light. And the word hates is to continually detest, disdain, deplore, and to strongly express disgust for the light. And I don't know if you've met any people that have that mindset, but I have. And they can be difficult to deal with. But we're seeing it on a grand scale in society today due to the hostility of the media and society for the things of God. I mean, I, I, I've got a, a friend of mine who, who goes to the Catholic Church. He's very regular. But Merrick Garland, who's head of the Justice Department, has actually had FBI agents go in infiltrating churches who are pro-life, which most Catholic churches are, labeling them as domestic terrorists. So he didn't make it to coffee one day this week, so I sent him a text, and I said, I hope you haven't been arrested. And he said, why? And I said, because according to the head of the Justice Department, you're a domestic terrorist, whether you know it or not. And, uh, but, but that's the hatred of the world, uh, for the things of God and, and the principles that we stand on in the Bible. And, and, and it's not just that, but it's the stand that we take on that we simply believe the Bible. Because when we say we believe the Bible, it shapes our life when we apply it to our lives. And there are some people who do not want their lives reshaped, remolded, and transformed, so they hate the light. Plato said, we can easily forgive a child who's afraid of the dark. Now get this. He said the real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. 
And that's where we're at today, where people are afraid of the truth of God's word, so they attacked it. So, some people, that, that, that their hearts are hardened because of pride, they're so full of pride, they don't realize how empty and hollow and without hope that they really are. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 8, Paul said, Just as you receive Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him. And this first heart and this soil prevents anybody from being rooted and built up. And he said, you're strengthened as your faith, as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So that's the first heart, and that's the first soil. The second hearts have soil that's just shallow. In verses 16 through 17 of our text, Jesus said, Others like seed sown on rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. And I call this the heart of excitation. This is the type of person that's excited by every new experience, by every new fad, by every new fashion. The the seed falls upon them and they immediately respond with joy. The seed takes root and grows up quickly, but because they're not staying in the word, as soon as they have a hard time, they begin to wilt. It's kind of like, I've always heard that you can sow fescue seed in any month that has an R. But once you get down and you get past April and you start trying to sow that seed in May, the summer temperatures cause it to wilt. I mean, you have to run up a a, a water bill uh, to keep that fescue wet enough and and it just has a hard time getting enough root in before you get on into June, July, and August. And so you've got problem and that's this type of, of, of heart. It springs up quickly, but when the heat of trials and tribulations of life comes along, they begin to wilt very quickly. Jesus says that this kind of life is shallow. You know the old saying, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen? Well, this heart can't stand the heat. We're living in a time when the truth of God's word is valued less than TV, than Facebook, and if you know what it is, the latest TikTok video that goes viral on social media. We're spending more time in the world instead of in the word, and that's why we're not growing as we should. We're abiding in the world instead of abiding in Christ. In John chapter 15, verses 7 and 8, Jesus said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. But this heart is so shallow it isn't bearing fruit and then there's a third type of heart some hearts have soil that is overgrown and infested with with the weeds of the world in verses 18 through 19 jesus said still others like seeds sown among thorns hear the word but the worries of this life the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word making it unfruitful This is the heart that's a heart of infestation. It's infested by the cares of the world, and and, and the the word for cares is anxiety. The person is so caught up with the cares and concerns of the world, they fail to focus on faith. It's infested by the deceitfulness of riches, and to be deceived means to be seduced, and that's exactly what happens when we love the world more than we love Jesus. It's what Paul had in mind when he said, Demas has forsaken me, loving the present world more than the world to come. G. Campbell Morgan believed that persecution is Satan's second best weapon. He thought the first best weapon was materialism, constantly planning for their own amusement and pleasure and not taking time for prayer and studying the Bible. And then this heart is invested by the desire for other things. And, and the idea of that is, if you read it, is the, is the lusting for all the rest. You know, we've already seen this, this, and this is a problem, but they are just fi- trying to find pleasure in anything that they can. In Proverbs 27:20, Solomon wrote, 
Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. You know, it's just, it's just like the way we eat around Thanksgiving and other times. You know, as long as that good piece of pie is there, we're going to eat it whether we're hungry or not. I always tell people I don't want to hurt the cook's feelings, so I need to eat me another piece of pie. Paul wrote to the church at Rome. He said, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. You know, we, we've got these desires in our lives and we have to control them or they will control us. In Romans 13, 14, Paul said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to arouse its desires. So we've got to make sure that what our life is not full of the world, but it's full of the word. And then number four, some hearts have soil that is fertile. In verse number 20, Jesus said, Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, and some 100 times what was sown. And this is the healthy heart that experiences germination. You see, healthy-hearted people not only hear the word, they accept it obediently, and they bear fruit. Luke 8, 15 says that this person keeps the word and bears fruit with patience, which means they endure the hardships. This person, I think, is like the Bereans that's mentioned in Acts chapter 17, 11. Now, the Berean Jews were a more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. They weren't just going to take what Paul said, said at face value. They were going to search the scriptures and make sure that he was not just a silver-tongued preacher that was leading them down a false path. They were going to validate what he said with the word of God. As a result, we're told, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. In John 15, 8, Jesus said, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. That's the proof of being a Christian is that we are fruit-bearing Christians because the word of God has germinated in our heart and is changing us. And the reason it changes us is because, as Paul said in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more we read the word, the stronger we get in our faith. Now, why did Jesus identify the seed as the word of God? Because the Bible explains it and describes it as being living and powerful. In Hebrews 4, 12, verses 13, uh, 12 through 13, for the word of God is alive and active. Some, some versions say living and powerful. It depends on which one you read, but it's alive, it's active, it's living, it's powerful. And Paul said sharper than any double-edged sword it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You see, the word of God is much different than the word of man. Life is inherent to the word of God. And that life is offered to those who hear it, to believe it, and those who receive it. Peter described it this way in chapter 1 and verse 23. You've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. It, there ne it never fails that when I read God's word, I learn something new. And that it challenged me, challenges me and it inspires me to live this thing that we call the Christian life. In Mark 12, 33 Jesus said, make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognized by its fruit. And the fruit that we bear describes really who we belong to, the way that we live our lives. In Colossians 1, verses 9 through 11, Paul said, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will, through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way. Here it is, 
bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. And when we allow the seed of God's word to germinate in our lives, we will be fruit-bearing Christians. We will, we will have good works that identify us as being a child of God. In 1963, there was an interesting discovery made at Masada. And uh, uh, that, that was an, really an escape route that Herod had to get away and to hide out. And, and uh, when his life wasn't in danger, sometimes he would go up there to get the cool breezes off of the Mediterranean during a, 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 a heat waves and such things. But I, we don't have time to really go into all of Masada. But it ended up being a refuge for the zealots, and the Romans came in to squash that rebellion, and, and, uh, and, and those Jews took a great stand there that that's the place where uh, many Jewish men go in and swear the oath of office when they go into the military. But they had all sorts of uh, storage of food and weapons in there trying to withstand the Romans. And in 1963, thousands of years after, after, after I mean, they'd been there that long, they found these, these seeds, date palm seeds. It was determined that they were about 2,000 years old. They were stored for another 30 years and were, fi and were finally planted in the soil in 2005 at a Jewish settlement near a lot. They sprouted about six weeks later, and by June of 2008, three years later, they were four foot tall. Now, I tell you that to say this. The word of God is viable and more powerful than those palm seeds. And even though those, those, those seeds were that old, the word of God is much older and is much more powerful. In Psalm 119, 9 through 11, it says, a question, how can you young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart have I sought you, O let me not wander from your commandments. Another way of saying God's word. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. See, David realized the power of God's word and the, and the life that's inherent to it. And if we let it germinate in our lives, our, our lives will be changed. And then again in Psalm 119, verses 130 and 133. The unfolding of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Then Paul, when he was writing to Timothy in his second letter, he said, Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God has given us all that we need to live the Christian life. And when we allow the inspired word of God to take root in our lives, to germinate in our hearts. It will give us, it will equip us for all that we need to live God's life, the Christian life. So that soil of our heart needs to be nurtured. So we've got a fertile field for God's word to bear fruit in our lives. Well, fathers, we come now. We want to thank you, Lord, for this first parable. And this message, Lord, that Jesus gave us, may we take its truth and apply it to our lives. Father, may we look at our lives and see what condition our heart is in. And may, Father, we do what is necessary to allow the Word of God to take root and to germinate in our lives, that we can be Christians that are known by the good fruit of your Word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. I want to thank you, Lord. For